A Man for All Markets, From Las Vegas to Wall Street, How I Beat the Dealer and the Market. By Edward O. Thorpe. Mathematician and investor Edward O. Thorpe's upbringing in the Great Depression greatly influenced his worldview. After winning at Las Vegas casinos with quantitative techniques using probability theories, Thorpe went on to invest on Wall Street, using the same approach. Thorpe started a hedge fund that steadily beat market returns. He aimed to strike the right balance between taking on too much risk and getting ruined, and risking so little as to miss out on profits. By 1975, Thorpe had become a millionaire, thanks to his investing expertise. He built the first wearable computer and was also a pioneer at valuing derivatives. In the 1990s, Thorpe saved a client from the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme. He attributes the housing market collapse of 2008 to excessive borrowing, enabled by government policy and aided by Wall Street securitizations. Thorpe extols the concept of compound interest and the benefits of indexing. He recommends that schools teach probability and statistics from kindergarten on to help people understand real-world issues. Summary the early years. Fascinated by numbers as a child, Edward O. Thorpe learned to add, subtract, multiply and divide numbers of any size before the age of five. Growing up during the Great Depression inculcated in him an appreciation for frugality, and it also spawned his business sense. After working as a newspaper delivery boy, he gained wider exposure to the world by taking a grueling test at age 12 to become a ham radio operator, exchanging messages with people across the globe. He also displayed a spirit of inquiry by conducting various science experiments during his school years, even as he survived a family dynamic of discord between his parents, who eventually divorced. From childhood, I was intrigued by the power of abstract thinking to understand and direct the natural world. At age 17, he ended up at the University of California in Berkeley, majoring in chemistry and barely making ends meet despite scholarships and part-time jobs. Ultimately, he transferred to UCLA and became interested in physics and math, going on to receive a PhD in mathematics. He also met his future wife, Vivian Sinatar, a fellow student at UCLA. What happened in Vegas? In 1958, during a foray into the world of Las Vegas gambling, Thorpe hit on the idea of getting an edge in the game of blackjack by applying a probability-based approach. His move to an academic post at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology MIT, in 1959 facilitated his work on a computer project aimed at winning at blackjack. Gambling is investing simplified. Thorpe received negative publicity when he presented his method to beating the casinos at an American Mathematical Society meeting. But, with backing from a pair of wealthy entrepreneurs, he eventually proved the success of his technique. Thorpe's card-counting approach turned out to be a winner, vindicating his efforts. It felt good to know that, just by sitting in a room and using pure math, I could change the world around me. Thorpe moved from his MIT post to an associate professorship at New Mexico State University. After his further investigations into casino practices that stacked the deck against customers, he wrote Beat the Dealer, a book about blackjack. Once he conquered that game, Thorpe went on to try ways to win at roulette and baccarat. MIT eventually credited Thorpe and a colleague, Claude Shannon, with building the first wearable computer, which Thorpe concealed under his clothes when he played in casinos. After he triumphed in Las Vegas, Thorpe took on the greatest casino on earth, Wall Street. Gambling on Wall Street. 
Thorpe's first leap into investments did not make money but made him aware of the peril of anchoring, in which investors hold on to a security position to wait for its return to a certain price. Another lesson he learned was not to expect any momentum in rising or falling stock prices to continue indefinitely. He also realized, via a failed investment in the silver market, that he had to watch out for conflicts of interest, in which stock promoters and salespeople do not have the same incentives as clients. Influenced by having been born during the Great Depression and by my early investment experiences, I made reducing risk a central feature of my investing approach. Looking to apply his gambling acumen to investing, Thorpe thought that he could best market indices through statistical methodologies with the help of computers. He saw investing as finding the right balance between taking on too much risk and getting ruined, and risking so little as to miss out on profits. He educated himself by reading up on the subject, including perennial favorites such as Graham and Dodd's security analysis. The psychological makeup to succeed at investing also has similarities to that for gambling. Great investors are often good at both. By this time, Thorpe had taken a new academic post at the University of California, Irvine, and his investing prowess had greatly boosted his financial means. Thorpe also was a pioneer in derivatives pricing, figuring out how to value stock warrants. Economists Robert Merton and Myron Scholes won the 1997 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for their derivatives pricing formula, which was similar to Thorpe's approach, outlined in his 1967 book Beat the Market. I call the flip side to the wisdom of crowds the lunacy of lemmings. Along the way, Thorpe met Warren Buffett, arguably the most successful investor of all time. Thorpe later became an investor in Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. While Buffett espoused a fundamental valuation approach to investing, Thorpe made money by exploiting pricing imbalances among the various securities a company issued. He would effectively hedge his position by going long on the security that was underpriced and simultaneously shorting the related overpriced instrument. This served to ensure him against market volatility. And while Buffett aimed to accumulate money by investing, Thorpe saw investing more as a way to engage in mathematics and confirm his theories in the investing world. This congruence with his profession enabled him to enjoy his academic career while investing on the side. I learned, to make proper risk management a major theme of my life for more than 50 years thereafter. In 1969, Thorpe set up a hedge fund, Convertible Hedge Associates, which later changed its name to Princeton Newport Partners PNP, in partnership with J. Regan, a New York stockbroker. Regan handled the business end of the firm, leaving Thorpe the job of generating investment ideas. Thorpe used his hedging technique, investing in both an underlying stock and an associated security, such as a convertible bond, option, preferred stock or warrant, to benefit from market mispricing. His mathematical computer models helped identity the mispricing and established him as an early quantitative investor, or quant. Lesson, it doesn't pay to push the other party to their absolute limit. A small extra gain is generally not worth the substantial risk the deal will break up. By 1975, Thorpe had become a millionaire, thanks to his investing expertise, and his family had upgraded its lifestyle accordingly, which alienated him from his academic colleagues of humbler means. Also, faced with the prospect of getting entangled in academia's petty power struggles, he decided to devote himself full-time to his hedge fund, giving up his professorship in 1982. Glory days. By 1979 a decade after he had co-founded the hedge fund, PNP had produced a 14.1% annualized return after fees. 
Over this period, the S&P 500 had turned in a mere 4.6% annualized return, after accounting for dividends, even though it exposed investors to greater risk than the hedge fund did. PNP then turned to other avenues for investment ideas, including an indicators project that studied various corporate financial metrics, such as price to earnings ratios, to see if they could gauge a stock's future earnings. Get good information early. How do you know if your information is good enough or early enough? If you are not sure, then it probably isn't. Thorpe ascribes the market crash of October 1987 to the use of portfolio insurance, which was supposed to protect investors against such crashes, yet ironically led to the rout. To hedge against losses, institutional investors protected their stock portfolios by using computer programs that automatically sold equities and purchased U.S. Treasury bills during a steep market downturn. Once the market started dropping, all those programs started selling stocks, which caused the market to plunge further. Thorpe was able to successfully arbitrage his way to a million-dollar profit in this crash. Our corporate executives speculate with their shareholders' assets because they get big personal rewards when they win, and even if they lose, they are often bailed out with public funds by obedient politicians. We privatize profit and socialize risk. But his hedge fund's glory days were about to end. In December 1987, IRS and FBI agents searched the company's offices as part of U.S. Attorney Rudolph Giuliani's plan to catch Wall Street wrongdoers. Although PNP was not directly implicated, since the government was actually looking for information to prosecute Drexel Burnham's Michael Milken and Goldman Sachs's Robert Freeman, the firm found itself in the crosshairs, because PNP co-founder Regan had been in close contact with both Milken and Freeman. Having shown that Bernie Madoff was posting made-up trades to my client's account, I had the smoking gun that proved fraud. The government employed the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations RICO Act, typically used against mobsters, to prosecute Milken and Freeman. Milken's financial innovation of high-risk, high-paying corporate bonds, or junk bonds, with which newcomers like Milken were taking over poorly managed older companies, threatened the stodgy, elite Wall Street firms. Giuliani accused Milken of multiple infringements of securities laws. Ultimately, the fallout ensnared PNP, forcing it out of business. A new road. With enough money to last his lifetime, Thorpe went on to enjoy the company of family and friends by engaging in leisure pursuits. In 1991, however, a consulting firm retained him as an advisor to investigate its hedge fund holdings, including one with a firm called Madoff Investment. Thorpe was skeptical about the steady returns that Bernie Madoff consistently generated for the company. He discovered that Madoff never made the options trades for which he had sent confirmations. Thorpe warned his client, and it quickly liquidated its Madoff investment. Thorpe also witnessed other frauds and swindles on Wall Street, which he once naively believed, because of laws protecting investors, to be free from cheating, unlike the casinos. People mostly don't understand risk, reward and uncertainty. Their investment results could be much better if they did. From 1992 to 2002, Thorpe got back into the Wall Street action, setting up a statistical arbitrage operation. XYZ, for investors. During that 10-year period, the project produced an annualized rate of return, before fees, of 18.2%, compared to 7.77% for the S&P 500. 
In 1994, he also created an investment partnership called Ridgeline Partners that enabled him to use his own capital and stakes from limited partners to invest in XYZ, providing an average annual return of 18% for each of its eight years. Between the two funds, he was managing up to $470 million at a time. Along the way, he also profited by as much as $1 million per year by exploiting stock price inefficiencies in some savings and loan institutions. Random Thoughts Thorpe extols the concept of compound interest, referring to it as the eighth wonder of the world. And he advises of the benefits of indexing, which he sees as the easiest way to outperform most investors and grow your wealth. In his rebuttal of the efficient markets hypothesis, which posits that stock prices reflect all available information and that investors can't beat the market, Thorpe points to the record of his own hedge fund as well as to that of Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. He notes that closed-end mutual funds often trade at discounts to their net asset values, which signifies that the market has not efficiently priced the fund's worth. What makes markets inefficient is that most investors don't have the necessary knowledge and information to accurately analyze an opportunity. Whatever you do, enjoy your life and the people who share it with you, and leave something good of yourself for the generations to follow. As for allocating money between different asset classes, Thorpe finds that market timers have had a worse track record than the value-oriented investors who buy undervalued assets and hold them until their prices rise. The technology bubble that burst in 2000 and the steep decline in equity markets in 2008 to 2009 hurt those who participated in the buying frenzy. Going by past results, he anticipates that equities and commercial real estate are the two asset categories that are likely to perform best in coming years for investors who prefer to buy and hold passive investments. Musing on the underlying causes of the Great Depression and the housing market collapse of 2008, he tracks both to excessive borrowing. Investors could put up as little as 10% of a stock's price and borrow the rest in the prelude to the Great Depression. Once stock prices started going down, the whole market collapsed. Similarly, he traces the 2008 calamity to poorly underwritten loans made to homebuyers with little or no down payments. Thorpe ties the housing market crash to government policy, buttressed by the real estate industry, aimed at expanding home ownership, coupled with mortgage industry lenders that sold loans to Wall Street for securitization, thereby ridding themselves of the risk. He also singles out the ratings agencies for being overly optimistic with the instrument ratings that the securities industry paid for, creating a conflict of interest. Ever since the 1980s, less stringent financial industry regulation has given rise to leverage, easy money and financial engineering, and brought about a series of asset bubbles, including the October 1987 market crash, the long-term capital management meltdown and the housing market bust. Thorpe attributes his success to the education he received in mathematics, as well as to his ability to learn on his own. Education wires the brain to maneuver the world, so he recommends that schools teach probability and statistics from kindergarten on to help people understand real-world issues. Children should also gain financial literacy. Thorpe rails against the politically connected rich, whose wealth enables them to essentially run the United States by manipulating politicians. He has nothing against rich people who succeed by fair means in a meritocracy. What he doesn't like is the accumulation of wealth through the foul means of pulling political strings. About the author. Edward O. Thorpe is the author of Beat the Dealer and the co-author of Beat the Market.